Well, you know, any day that you can start with Pastor Chris Simmons is a good day. You know, many of you have served over the years down at Cornerstone, but we know COVID took the wind out of our sails in a number of areas, and one of them happens to be in terms of our service outside the walls of this church. This is a great opportunity to re-engage. And he mentioned Thanksgiving serve. I'm down there every Thanksgiving. It is a part of my tradition now. I hope I'll see some of you down there, but you can serve down there each and every day of the week as well as with our other ministry partners. Well, this past Sunday, our pastor began a new series, More Than We Can Imagine. And last week, we talked about the people who, who came together came together with a conviction and a faith that God was calling them to plant a church in the Park Cities. 84 years. Last Sunday of this month, we'll be celebrating 84 years as a church family. I like to think about those people. I think like to think about the prayers that they were praying and the passion that they brought to it. They couldn't help but talk about it. There's a story in our church history about how they were talking about it, and the Dr. George Truitt happened to come by. And he asked them what they were talking about, and they told him, and he said, well, there ought to be a church in the Park Cities. And this group that loved Jesus, and they trusted one another with a missionary's heart and zeal said, we could do this. And without any other supports, they came together. And in October 1939, this church was planted. But let me ask you, could they have ever imagined? Could they have ever imagined this church in this day at this time? A church that in 84 years was a church that was a beacon and a lighthouse in this city. Leading in Baptist causes all across our nation. A church that was investing in ministries across our state and across our world. And not just in this day, all across the decades. Could they have ever imagined? You know, a few months ago, Pastor Jeff made a statement, and it's one that I've kind of held. And it harkens back to what Dr. Truett said, well, there ought to be a church in the Park Cities. And Jeff stood here and he said, we believe now more than ever before that there still ought to be a church in this place right here, right now, in our day and for years to come. Is that an amen? That's an amen. And so all across this series, we're going to be looking at kind of the initial strands of DNA that are still with us in this church. We're looking at five distinctives. And so last week, the pastor led us through how Christ centers us. Today, we're looking at how Scripture guides us. And you can't walk in this sanctuary and not know that over the generations that Scripture has guided us, it screams from the facility. As you drive by, you see Scripture on our steeple. You walk in the sanctuary. It's emblazoned across the beams of this room. Cultural engagement propels us. Serving defines us. You're hearing from our ministry partners each and every week. And this isn't all of them. We have many ministry partners. Serving defines us. And then on the last Sunday of this month, we're going to gather in here at 10 a.m. All of our services, chapel, sanctuary, great hall, Spanish language. And we're going to squeeze in here on that day. And we're going to talk about how God's glory defines us. God's glory defines us. Now, last week, the pastor asked that during this series that we memorize two very short verses. So Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21, we read last week. We're going to read it this week. Now, here's what I want, the way I want you to read it this week. I want you to read it with the passion that the apostle Paul spoke these words as they're being dictated. So let's read this together. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Passion. There's passion in God's church. But the question for us today is, do you believe what you just read? Do you believe that in your life? Do you believe that God wants to do far more abundantly than that which you ask in this day? That which you pray. Do you believe that in this church? Do our dreams for the future, are they really subservient to the heritage of the past? Now, we love our history. We love our heritage. I'm a history geek. I know the history of Park Cities. I'm so grateful to be in a church like Park Cities Baptist Church. And there's few churches in America that can match the history that we all share. 
But my friends, if we don't have a dream for the future, this church will close its doors one day. They're closing all across our nation. What is God calling us to do in this day? We celebrate our past. We look to the future. But we only have right now this day. And so as we celebrate the faith of those in 1939, should the Lord tarry in 84 years, will people be celebrating the faith that we have today? I hope that you were out for the baptism service last week. It was just a grand affair. 42 people who say, said, Jesus is my Lord. And you know what struck me as some of the children were being baptized? I thought, you know, should the Lord tarry? There's some of those boys and girls that may still live in this community in 84 years. There's some of those boys and girls that made their profession of faith through the ministries of this church that can give testimony to what we were about this day. Now in 84 years, they're not going to remember any of our names. But may they know the faith that we bring to Park Cities and our future in these days. So these are must-attend Sundays. Be here all across this series. And if you have to miss, go to the website. Watch it later on. And ask yourself the questions that we're going to be asking across this season. Now, one of the things that we're giving you today as a tool is your bulletin. Open your bulletin up, and you're going to see there's a tear-out. There's a question at the top. And each week, you're going to find another tear-out with a different question. Today, as we talk about how Scripture guides us, we're asking ourselves, how will you focus on Scripture reading? That's a great question. How will I focus on Scripture reading? Now, you're noticing there's some blank spaces there. Take some notes. See what the Lord is saying to you in this day. Keep this in your Bible. And at the end of the series, pull them out, look at them collectively, and see how is God responding in your heart and your life to the needs and challenges of this day. So be with us each and every week. Well, last week, Pastor Jeff, he began how Christ centers us, and we looked at Acts chapter 2. And if you remember in Acts chapter 2, you have the birth of the new church, the birth of the church that we celebrate today. And so when Jesus had ascended to the Father 10 days prior, he had said, I want you to wait, and then I want you to be my witnesses. So for 10 days, they had waited. They had prayed, 120 gathered in this room. And on Pentecost Day, 50 days past the Passover, the Holy Spirit came that morning and He came in power. You remember the story? There were flames of fire upon them. And it was in them. And they went out the doors and by day's end, 120 had multiplied to 3,000 people and they were baptized. You know, we were celebrating 42, 3,000 that are professing that Jesus is their Lord. Now, if you've been walking through the dwell readings with us, you know that we're reading through the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you'll see in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 that the church continues to multiply. In Acts chapter 4, verse 3, it says there's 5,000 men within the church. That means a church of well over 10,000. You get to Acts chapter 5, verse 38, and you see what they're doing. It says day by day they're proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where? They go house to house. And in Acts 5.14 it says, And more than ever believers were added to this church. Then you come to Acts chapter 6. Now across these chapters there's been pressure from without the church. What they're doing is being noticed. But in Acts chapter 6 there's a pressure within the church. There's a disagreement that we're a Baptist church. And so there's a problem that has come up to the church, has come to the apostles, and it had to do with how they were serving the needs within the body. They had grown so rapidly they weren't able to keep up. And the needs of the Grecian widows were being ignored. At least they were felt to be ignored. And so they prayed and they came and they felt called to bring seven leaders into the church as deacons. And what was their role? It was to serve. And the church approved. And in verse 7 it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied. So what happened? They came together in prayer. They sought the Lord as we're seeking to do in these days. And what happened? The church continues to multiply. This movement just keeps going and going. Multiply greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Next verse in verse 8. 
The first one that was mentioned as a new deacon was Stephen. And it says here, Stephen was full of grace and power and was doing great wonders and signs. Now, what we need to understand is, this was not done in a vacuum. The leaders in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders knew what was going on and they were watching it. They weren't happy. They had brought the apostles in. It hadn't worked. And they're looking at what's happened and you see that all of a sudden a bullseye comes on this young man, Stephen. You know, they had thought with the death of Jesus, that which they had orchestrated as the Sanhedrin, that this foolishness was going to be over. And what they're finding is that that relatively small group of disciples that was following him, they're now in the tens of thousands. And they're growing rapidly. And not only that, their followers have far more zeal now than they ever did when he was alive. And so what they do is they bring charges against Stephen. And the charges had to do with blasphemy regarding the temple. That which was central to their lives. And they call for Stephen to be brought before the Sanhedrin. Chapter 6, verse 15, it says, And they gazed at him. That was a gaze meant to intimidate. Meant to put him in his place. But that verse continues and it says, And all who sat in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 7. We're going to see what happens next in this story. Now in the midst of this trial, what we're going to see is that God was with Stephen. That this new believer was empowered by the Spirit and the Spirit of God does something within him. It activates the Scriptures of God that are within him. Stephen knew the Word of God. And it's the Word of God by which he makes his defense. So if you take notes, the first point is this. Scripture speaks anywhere. Scripture speaks anywhere. Look with me. Verse 1. Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and you shall go to the land I will show you. Now, I wish we had time to walk all the way through this chapter. We don't. But Stephen bases his defense on how God speaks to his people outside of the temple and outside of Jerusalem. And he begins with Father Abraham. And he says that Father Abraham was in Mesopotamia. Where's that? It would be modern day Syria. And yet God spoke to him. And what he does is he walks through the early patriarchs. He talks about Joseph in Egypt. He heard from God. He spoke to Moses from a burning bush in Midian. Well, where is Midian? Modern day Saudi Arabia. You see that he speaks to the whole nation when they're in the Sinai and he gives them the law. God is speaking all across the ages to his people. And it's not in Jerusalem. You get to verse 49 and he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will be my resting place? Has not my hand made all these things? And so what you see in Stephen's defense is, in 53 verses, by my count, he is quoting Scripture 12 different times. 12 different times. God brings that which is within him, empowers it, activates it, and he speaks it. Is he seeking to show that God will speak his word as he wills any place? Now, the problem for the Jewish leaders was that they had put God in a box. They had put God in a box. We do that. This was a box of their own making. They believed that God could only speak by their traditions, that God could only speak in certain ways, in certain places, to certain people. And now, don't miss the fact of who he's speaking to. There are lots of Pharisees on that Sanhedrin. And the Pharisees know the Word of God. They have it memorized. You try memorizing the book of Numbers. They know the book of Numbers. But what is apparent here is, although they knew the Word, they did not know what the Word was saying to them. 
You know, Pastor Jeff is doing something I'd really recommend to you. It's during our Wednesday Grow Series, and he's downstairs in our fellowship hall at 6.30, and he has the pastor's roundtable. It's an opportunity for you to come to take dwell passages and to learn how to faithfully read the Word of God. In other words, to read it in context and faithfully interpret it. And for the people that Stephen is speaking to, they are not doing this. They have the Word of God, but it's in their own box. It's in their box. What about us? You know, this past Sunday, I was in a connect group, and one of my favorite people, Burdell Kreischer, was teaching. And she was speaking on aging. And I was taking notes, and one of the things that she says is, my call is to take with me what I will need as I age, that which I will carry home. That which will carry me home. You know, I can remember with my own mother, as she aged, there were lots of losses. One of the losses was her eyesight. And as her eyesight was growing dim, her doctor finally helped us step in and say, you've got to give up your car. Now, she didn't like driving that much, but she did like control, and it was a loss of control that she mourned. She wouldn't let us take the car out of the garage. My brother, he didn't entirely trust her, so he took the spark plug out. <laughs> she never complained, so we believe she was good to her word, and that was she never tried to drive again. There are losses in life as we go through life. But one thing that can never be taken away from you is the Word of God. One thing that can never be taken to you is the Word of God and how to interpret it as you walk through your life. Keith Lowry, our discipleship pastor, talks about how for a disciple's life, there's a thousand different decisions every day. You know, a lot of them are unconscious. Have you ever gotten to work and realized you didn't know how you got there? Anybody besides me do that? Because just a couple. So when you see me, then you might want to steer me a wide berth. I may not be paying attention. A lot of the things that we have to make decisions on, they're just unconscious. But there are those decisions where we come to that why in the road. And right there at the center is a disciple's life. If we know how to faithfully appropriate the Word of God and we have it in our heart, we have the ability to make a disciple's decision on what it means to follow Jesus. So a question for each of us today is, does the Bible guide my decisions in life? All of us have decisions. That the Bible is not just an intellectual exercise. It is life. It's the Word of God. And it's crucial and it's center to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now think about the needs that you bring into this service today. You know, I was up here yesterday and I was preparing for this and I was waiting on an email, so I pulled my phone out and I went to a news feed. That was a mistake. I saw the crisis of the government shutdown. I saw about the crisis of climate change. I saw a crisis coming in the economy and five reasons it was going to melt down. And then I saw one that really caught my eye. The Rangers may not make the World Series. Okay, I mean, I was concerned right there. How do you deal with with what is coming into your life. These are anxious days. We've talked a lot about this in recent months. Anxiety is rampant across this nation, from our children all the way to our oldest adults. Well, how do you handle that? The Scriptures. The Scriptures speak of peace. One of my favorite passages is in Roman, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. And it begins by saying to rejoice in the Lord. But then Paul goes on to say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything what? And thanksgiving, bring your request to God. God speaks to the needs that you bring into this service, whether it's a relational need, a health need, an economic need. God knows the needs of our heart, and He offers us direction through His Word. Psalm 119.11, I have hidden. I have stored your word in my heart that what? That's pretty good. Some of you did Bible drill as a kid. That I may not sin against you. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when I come to that why in the road and I have to make a decision, the word of God again within me, activated by the Holy Spirit, will illuminate my path to make the right description. Decision. Scripture will 
guide us. But we have to know the Word of God. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? There are going to be trials in your life. Are you prepared for what's to come? Again, know the Word of God. Now, we want to help you. That's why we have connect groups. I love connect groups. Connect groups are where a big old church because a small, becomes a small, intimate family. We do that family life around the Word of God. It's where we mobilize for ministry. It may be where some of you will sign up to go help at Cornerstone on Thanksgiving or to serve in any other of the ways that we have, such as the Vickery community. It's how we do that. It's where we celebrate life's joys and we mourn our losses. It's where you can go when you have a need and you can need prayer. That's what a connect group does. My wife and I were at a connect group dinner club just this past Friday night with five other couples. And it was a time just to come together and to laugh as we heard stories about how we all came together and all the mishaps across life. It's the fellowship of the church. And if you're missing that fellowship, I can promise you this, you're going to be disappointed at some point. You're going to be disappointed by Park City's Baptist Church because you are going to have a need and there is no one there to help you through that need. If you're not a part of the Connect Group, we want to help you. And following this service, I'll be out in the foyer uh, with others. We'd love to be able to help you. Also, Dwell. You know, in the past year, Dwell has just become kind of core within our church. I was in a committee meeting the other night, and it was a very ticklish subject we were talking about. And the committee chairman started off our meeting by saying, you know, in my Dwell reading, this is what I discovered. And he talked about the unity of the body, and he said, you know what, that's what's paramount in this discussion is how we make this decision in unity as a church. Stories are beginning to come out of our dwell readings. I want to show you a video right now of a couple within our church and how God used the power of His Word to change their lives for eternity. I'm David Couch. I'm Laura. We have two sons and we've been married a little over seven, seven years, years now. now. And we've been at the church for about two years. That's right. I met Laura, um, probably you know, a, a couple years after college, and we really hit it off on our first few dates. A topic came up of, what's your religion? What do you, what do you practice? And I assumed we're from the South. He went to TCU, he played football. He's a Christian. Everybody here is Christian, right? And he told me he's not a Christian, and that was heartbreaking. So I said, I don't practice religion. Um, I don't, I don't believe in God. I consider myself atheist on worst days, probably agnostic at best, and was pretty, I think, pretty anchored to that position. And from that night forward, the prayer was, dear Lord, please open his heart, light a little fire in his heart. And, um, that's been the prayer. I think as our relationship went on though, I think Laura was always praying for me and always, you know, I think leaving breadcrumbs or or putting things out there, you know, she would send me devotionals sometimes, you know, um, and point me in that direction. And again, I, I'd be receptive, but I wouldn't say I was, I was buying in. I wanted her to pursue her faith. I'm okay with raising our family in that. And, you know, I'm okay with the status quo. About two years ago, we had something happen in my family that was brought me to my knees world rocking, world shattering, devastating, and it was the catalyst for our faith journey. It was so galvanizing how she was in her faith um, and how she turned to God and turned to scripture. And for me, I think my heart, I could feel my heart start to open or to be less hard. And we were coming here um, at the time and I, again, I wanted to get there or have an idea of getting there, but I was still kind of going through the motions, I would say, you know, going to service. And it wasn't until I think me actively pursuing and God speaking to me more in that way, um, where I was able to, I guess, embrace it. Looking at Dwell, it's like, I need to go back. <laughs> and so I think it's been reading, you know, reading the gospel and getting acquainted with the gospel. I think it was, it was probably been less than a year. And I asked Lawrence, like, what is the like, I actually don't even know what is the gospel. All of a sudden, one day, I was like, I, I believe. 
it was just such an, a, a crazy moment for me because I think if I you know look back five years ago, I just never, I just, I just never saw myself. And being in the scripture every day is us actively choosing God and to pursue that relationship. Feels like the answer to a prayer I said eight years ago and have continued to say every day, and it's transformed us. <laughs> Today we're being baptized. It's, it's awesome, yeah, to make a public profession of our faith. I think it's it's a it's another it's end of one chapter. It feels like for us. And, obviously the beginning of a, a much bigger one where I, I wouldn't be here without God speaking to me and my wife. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I've had that in my life and, and the opportunity to be where I am today. God speaks through his word. Join us in Dwell. Be a part of what God's doing. Now you can go to our website and if you look under Dwell, you're going to find resources. And one of the new resources is a new journal, and they're going to be out in the foyer this morning if you haven't received one. And it's just something you can use as you read through your passages, and you can ask the questions, God, what do you say? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Activate the Word of God in your heart and in your life. Now, secondly, Scripture speaks to anyone. So if you're taking notes, Scripture speaks to anyone. Now, part of Stephen's defense has been that he has seen God graciously dealing with the people of Israel all across the generations. God has dealt graciously despite their constant rebellion. But all of a sudden, in verse 51, he changes quickly and he jumps to the very end of his message. He says, verse 51, you stiff-necked people, you uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Now, how is that for an invitation right there? You know, Rebecca earlier in the service talked about Scripture being sweet as honey, like drops of honey dropping from a honeycomb. And you saw in that video that David came to Christ as a result of his sweet wife's testimony, her prayers, but it was the Word of God that brought conviction upon his life. And that's one side of conviction. But there's another side. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And the other side of the coin on conviction is we don't have to respond to it. Spirit-led conviction. And what Stephen says brings conviction into the people's hearts. And what we see is their reaction. Now, I'll tell you, a preacher can always tell if he has the room. I was preaching here one time last year, and I noticed someone right over here, and you may be here today, so you may be convicted by this, but I noticed that they did this big yawn, and their arm goes back, and they looked at their watch. Well, it was only two minutes into the sermon. I mean, it was a little deflating right there. He read the room. He knew that he wasn't going to be able to finish and he jumps to what he wanted to get to and that is they are being called to repent. And he's nailed it. He says, you are hard-hearted. You are stiff-necked. And they're not responding to the Word of God because to do so would mean they were complicit in the death of Jesus. In John chapter 5, dealing, uh, Jesus is dealing with the same issue. He is under questions because He healed on the Sabbath. And he looks at these people and says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. We read scripture for the purpose of seeing Jesus. From Genesis through Revelation. The ultimate purpose of Scripture is to point to Jesus. He's the lens by which we interpret Scripture. And so you see in Acts chapter 7, when He comes down on them, it's because they're not responding to what God says. And my friends, it's possible to be in the church. 
It's possible to know the Word of God, and it is very possible to not obey it, to not follow the Word of God. And that's why we're saying all of us need to be in Scripture, and we need to be asking these questions. What are you saying to me, and what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Be the wise man that builds your life upon the rock. And the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ground our lives in the Scriptures, those words. And again, when needs come up, the Spirit within us activates them. Let me ask you a question as we get ready to close. What sets your worldview in these days? What's determining how you respond to all the changes that we're witnessing in our nation and our culture? You know, if your source of information is media, you're going to be disappointed. You know, you go into a restaurant, everybody's on their phone. They're watching their news feeds. If they're of a certain age, they're on TikTok. They're looking what the influencers are saying. For some of you, your cultural opinions may shift like a politician's. A politician might have a strong conviction, and to the polls show that that conviction is not going to reelect them. We need to look at what never changes, what never shifts, what is the solid rock. And the reason that people are so anxious is everything is shifting in these days. And the Word of God speaks truth into all of these issues. Now, one would be the questions regarding the LBGTQ community. And it is being cast as either you affirm us or you hate us. That's how the conversation is being framed. And for a Christian, our response is neither. We cannot affirm and we cannot hate. Well, why? Because of the Word of God. And so we see in God's Word what it means to live a life as a faithful disciple and how to interpret that which is coming into our lives according to what God is saying to us. Look with me in verse 55. In verse 55, Stephen, it says, is full of the Holy Spirit. He looks up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So what's happening? There's a mob mentality that now seems to be forming in the uh, the Sanhedrin. Just before that, it says that they have responded and they are enraged. They are grinding their teeth. They're gnashing their teeth. And they're coming for Stephen. And he looks up. And the next verse says, when he talks about seeing Jesus, they put their hands over their head. The question for each of us is, are we ready like Stephen? Because Stephen lost his life. You know, when he woke up that morning, did he know it was his last morning? I don't know. But we do know this, he was ready. My friends, God speaks anywhere, any place, any time. And one day, he'll speak to each of us. He'll speak to each of us. Are we prepared for that conversation? If you're here today, you may have been in this church for a generation. But if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I don't care how much scripture you know, you're not prepared for the conversation. Today could be your day. If you're not part of a community that loves you and you've never come and said, I want to be a part of this church like all those people did on the screen earlier, be a part of a community that is going to help you grow in what it means to know the Lord, to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus. If you're here today and you're not part of a group, we'd love to be able to help you. One of the questions that you might be writing down is, how can I be more effective in daily reading the Word of God? It changes lives. It changed the new couple that is in our church that testified this past Sunday, Jesus is my Lord. It's changing their little boys' lives as they see their their parents active and engaged in the Bible and with God's people. So have you trusted Him?